Let's open it up to page 83. This takes us into this, the, what I guess is labeled the fourth letter. You'll notice that you get, have just letters 2, 4, 6, 8, the even numbers. This is because um, we only have her side of it. So um, we do have Leibniz's side, like academics do have it. They didn't print it with this. And um, I may have, I meant to mention this, I didn't. Um, sorry. You can get a summary of what Leibniz's letters have on pages 78 and 79. The editor of this book kind of summarized them there. Um, you might wonder, I mean, why didn't they put Leibniz's letters in here with hers? My guess, actually, is it may not have been translated into English. And ra so rather than it trying to do a brand new translation, let's just print her side of it and give a summary. Um, that may have been what happened here. Um, so in the first, sorry, in the initial letter, Leibniz reaches out to Lady Masham. In letter number two, she kind of expresses some interest in his philosophy and some questions about it. In letter number three from Leibniz, he tells her where to like find resources to, that will help her understand his philosophy. So part of what we get now in letter four, which is where our reading uh, comes from, uh, pages 83 and 84, is where she s first summarizes his philosophy, and I say actually summarizes it very well, and then raises some questions about it, um, questioning you know, whether this really makes sense. So let's read pages 83 and 84, and as we read um, this paragraph, I want to uh, have you look into this, and I want you to answer when we're done, what is the problem that she is raising here? She says, Force, I presume, cannot be the essence of any substance, but is the attribute of what you call a form, soul, or atom of substance of the essence whereof I find no positive idea. Your negation of their having any dimensions makes their existence, I confess, inconceivable to me, as not being able to conceive an existence of that which is nowhere. If the locality of these substances were accounted for by their being, as you say, as you say they are, always organized in bodies, then they are somewhere. But if these atoms of substance are somewhere, then they must have some extension, which you deny of them. Who, I think, also placed the union of the soul with its respective body in nothing else but that correspondence or conformity, whereby in virtue of a pre-established harmony. Um, and so on about the pre-established harmony. So what was she saying? About, what's the issue that she's raising about these atoms of substance? Yeah. Going against, like, She's going against Leibniz's uh, kind of idea of monads that um, they that they have no extension, and she said that they must have extension because they must be somewhere in order for them to exist at all. So they must have some kind of extension in order for them to exist at all. Yeah, she's making an argument that they've got to have some kind of extension, and this is one of the kinds of arguments she's giving. So if they're somewhere, then they're located somewhere. If they're located somewhere, then they've got to take up space. They take up space, they got to yeah, extend. Yeah. That's one line of thought. Good. What's another one that she may have in here? You might see. Is she also saying that things, that monads themselves don't have essences, but things that we perceive do have essences, the things that exist do have essences? I don't think so. I don't know if, if there was any particular thing that drew that out or something that might resonate. I don't think, I don't see that here. Um, what else might be in here? Yeah? If you can't physically see something, then, like, you can't be. Yeah, and this is at the earlier part where she's saying, I can't conceive, I can't imagine what a, a monad is. Can you picture one? I mean, all that we know about monads is what they're not. They're not extended. They don't have parts. They um, are not material, and so on. And she's like, well, you, you're just telling me the <laughs> negation, the absence of what these things are, but you can't tell me positively what they are. What are they? What should I picture? What should I imagine when I think of a monad? So. Here's one way to get at this. This isn't the only way to capture what she's doing. Um, 
these monads are supposed to have no extension or dimension. And this is, by the way, this letter was before he wrote the monadology, so he's calling them right now atoms of substance, um, which is the language we, we've seen in the older writings of Leibniz. So she, the first thing she's saying is, I don't have a positive idea of what these monads are. Like, I don't know positively what to say about them. You're only telling me negatively what they're not. And, and part of that includes, I'm not able to imagine or conceive or picture even one of these things. Um, and then the second kind of argument is closer to, to what Zach was saying, which is that to organize and arrange monads or for them to exist in some place implies that they must take up space and then must imply they have a physical location, which implies that they are extended. If you think about this, Leibniz is saying everything is composed of all these monads. But how can this book be an infinite number of monads if monads are not extended? How could they all be located in this configuration? If they're not extended, how can one be to the right or to the left, above or next to another one? Um, it seems like you need to give them some physical dimensions for them to stand in physical configurations. Um, after saying that his theory of pre-established harmony is merely possible, she mentions this on page 83, um, Leibniz tells her that his position is the truth because it is more perfect and a supremely, infinitely wise being would prefer to make it that way. So in the interim between these two letters, this is what takes place in like letter number five, is Leibniz um, responds to her claim that where she says, your idea about pre-established harmony and these monads or atoms of substance is interesting. I can imagine, I can sort of understand how it's possibly true, but you're not saying that this is like actually the case, are you? And his response is, yeah, I'm not just saying this is a possibility. I'm trying to tell you that this is the way it is. Why is it this way? Why does, what is the force of his argument? The force of his argument comes from this is the, way, the best way it could be. Um, that this, it is better for the world to be this way than any other way. And if it's better for it to be this way, then that's the way God would make it. So let's take a look at her response to this line of reasoning on page 86. Um, um, look at the middle paragraph there, and let's start about in the middle of this. Um, Right after that French phrase, which just says, arranged by a sovereign wisdom, so she says, what you would build upon this, the this referring to is like philosophical idea that this world is like the best arrangement of the way things could be, forms a very transcendent conception of the divine artifice, and such as I think could only occur to the thoughts of one possessed with the highest admiration of the wisdom of his maker. But if you infer the truth of this notion only from its being the most agreeable one that you can frame to that attribute of God, this singly seems to me not to be concluding. Since we can, in my in opinion, and this is probably the key part here, only infer from thence that whatsoever God does must be according to infinite wisdom. But we are not able, with our short and narrow views, to determine what the operations of an infinitely wise being must be. So Leibniz says, my view, is the, my view of the world is not just a possibility, it's the truth. It's the truth because it's the best way things could be, and an infinitely wise being would want to make it this way. What is she saying here in response to that? Yeah, Will? the way wise being that's right. Um, while we may assume that God will act according to infinite wisdom, we cannot know what that is. It's sort of like if you if you want to play really good basketball, you might ask yourself in a situation, what would Michael Jordan do? But here's the problem: you're not going to know what Michael Jordan would do unless you've like really studied the way he plays. You can't figure it out unless you really understand the way that Michael Jordan works. 
let alone, and don't even get me started how we, we even play that way. Um, Leibniz is sitting around saying, God would make the world this way because it's the best way to make it. But she's sitting there, how do you know this is the best way to make it? How do you know an infinitely wise being would agree with you? For all we know, couldn't God think that your way of doing it is not the best way? That there maybe is a better way than even the way you have thought about it? What makes you think that you are so sure um, about getting it right? Because he's not just arguing this is a good world, he's arguing that this is the best of all possible worlds. Look at the way she puts this on the top of page 88. Um, and this is that little paragraph at the very top. Um, that God does in framing and ordering of all his works always makes use of the most simple means, I doubt not, this appearing to me most suitable to his wisdom. But whether or no these simple means or methods are always such as surpass not a created intelligence, I do not know. But I am very apt to believe that God's ways are past our finding out in this sense. So, one of the things that she's bringing up here is that while we can trust that if there is a God, he does things according to an infinite and perfect wisdom, we're not really in a position to be able to tell what that would consist of. And so Leibniz's argument maybe overestimates the, ability, the abilities of human reasoning. Um, this is one thing to think about with, with Descartes and Leibniz both. They are both putting forward philosophical views that really allow us to know a lot about the nature of God. Maybe the, a lot of people are more skeptical about that. Maybe we, should be, maybe we shouldn't claim to understand all these aspects of God's nature. Now, Leibniz cautions her in the letter we don't have, saying that she should be careful not to, uh, to, be, to press this skeptical line about God too far. Um, for one, you could fall into you know, not believing in God anymore, because the more you get skeptical about this stuff, the more you might say, well, then I, if I don't know the way God would act, how do I know, you know how can I infer that he exists? Part of the way that I make this inference is I say, well, God would create a beautiful world. Well, if God's ways are unknown to me, if I can't really discern how God would reason, then how do I know that if there's a beautiful world, that God would be the author of it? So, and it could get even worse. Philosophers today who deal with this worry about the possibility. If you don't really know God's motives and his intentions, if you, don't, if you can say, look, God's ways are so beyond my ways, I can't make any judgments about what God would or wouldn't do, then you're open to the possibility that God might have a good reason to systematically lie to us. Maybe God has good reason to tell people, you know, be good, you know, pray, go to church, read the Bible, when in fact those are all the wrong things to do. What you should be doing is going out and having promiscuous sex, you know, getting drunk, indulging in, you know, rock and roll and all the, 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 these other things that you were told not to do in church, um, maybe God has a good reason to trick us. How do you, if you can't discern God's ways, how do you know he's not lying to us? So you have to be careful how far you go with this sort of skepticism. The next thing she says on 88 is also important, and this raises... Uh, the problem of free will. So, um, you see it in the middle of page 88, or you can look at it on the screen. She raises this. She says, how, to, how do we reconcile your system to liberty or free agency? For though in regard of any compulsion from other causes we are courting thereto free, yet I see not how we can be so in respect to the first mover. So, she says, according to his system, I can see how we can be free from other causes, but not with regard to the first mover. What does that mean? What is she talking about? She's talking about other causes and how we're free with those. And on the other hand, how we're she doesn't see how we're free from this first mover. Hmm? It's like the first 
person who ever made an action influenced everyone else's action. So were our actions are based on anything in the past that has happened? That's good. It's not what you mean, but that's really good actually, considering you know that there's something very specific she has in mind for a first mover. But you're pretty much right, except for one thing: who who determined how that first agent would be, that first person would be? God determined it, so we had no free will. So God is the first mover. So what does she mean then about all these about being free without being comp compelled from other causes? I think this is just that part of Leibniz's philosophy that says nothing can cause, like no, no outside cause can, ca can influence another substance. So that you're free, once again, to just do whatever you want. Nothing is going to stop you from being you. Nothing is going to prevent you from fulfilling your nature. But there is a sense in which you're not free with, with what kind of nature you have. This is the very question that was brought up earlier in the class, which is that we want free will not only to apply to outside causes, but if God has caused us to exist with this very character, this very nature, this very essence that makes us what we are, then you're not free to change that. And so for that reason, a lot of people say, but I just don't see how that gets free will on the table. And that's exactly... What she's bringing up here is that very same concern. How can we have free will if the first mover, if God, made us such that we have to have this very nature that includes all of our actions, past, present, future? Now, Leibniz does not really respond to her at all on this point. He just tells her to read Locke's philosophy on free will. And I'm hoping that we'll have a chance to talk about that when we get to that in about two weeks. Um, and we'll see if you think that answers this or not. Um, are there any questions? I know I'm skipping over quite a bit here. So are there any questions about anything up to page 89 from this reading? Page 80 to 89. Um, these are just a couple of the highlights of some of the things that she's bringing up. As you were reading, did you have any questions about some of these passages or insights or comments that you wanted to make about this before I just blitz over it? So this is, I'm going to skip over some of these middle letters that are much more about issues of uh, personal matters. During this time, John Locke dies. Um, one of Leibniz's close friends die. And so the two of them exchange cordial pleasantries that don't really do a lot of philosophy. So in the very last letter that we have, we come return to philosophy, and this is where Leibniz asks about her father's philosophy. He's trying to kind of see where does her father's philosophy, what does it have to say that might be similar or contribute or be related to his own philosophy? This is, brings us into a discussion of Ralph Cudworth's view of plastic nature, is what it was called. And a very famous debate that took place between these two other minor philosophers, Leclerc and Bale. Plastic nature is something that Cudworth came up with as an intermediary that is supposed to exist between the divine world and the created world. Um, it is a kind of impersonal substance that maintains the instincts of animals, natural laws and particles and things, and the general order of the universe. Um, people were wondering things like, why do birds always at least in our hemisphere, why do they fly south for the winter? Or wh why is it that bears always know that they're supposed to hibernate? How is it that fish are able to swim in these schools? Um, it doesn't seem like, they're not smart, like they're not like reasoning, it's not like they look around and they're going, oh, it's time for us to do this, or I better do that. So one of the things Cudworth was trying to do is to say, that this is part of the way that God regulates the natural world without God having to step in all the time and miraculously change it, or without God like implanting into them a kind of like full-blown innate knowledge. Like, you don't, he, he was trying to avoid attributing so much reason to nature that it was like, 
making them like us, but on the other hand, not wanting God to intervene every moment and do a miracle. So it's supposed to allow for both divine providence and interaction without falling into the occasionalism that we've talked about, where God would miraculously step in at each moment and, and direct the natural world. Questions about that? This is not, of course, in the reading, so this is a little bit of background to bring us into the, to the reading. Now, this guy, Baal, he argued that her father's view is incoherent because um, he kind of thinks that the only way that this could work is if God was constantly interacting with it. So, she says that his argument is begging the question against her father. In other words, that he assumes that the natural order can only be governed by either giving animals and natural objects like innate ideas, or by God sort of governing them from like outside external causes. This plastic nature is supposed to be actually something that's different from both of those. It's not that, that God governs these animals from within, or he governs them from without. It's almost like this other thing that channels the natural world. In a, in a natural way. Let's take a look at another part of her father's philosophy and how this might relate. So let's take a look on page 93. <coughs> um, she says, and this, this dropped down about, I don't know, maybe like eight or nine lines. Um, she says, since my father does not therein assert, as Mr. Bale says he does, that God has been able to give to creatures a faculty of producing excellent works, such as is the organization of plants and animals, separate from all knowledge, etc., but only a faculty of executing instrumentally his ideas or designs in the production of such excellent works, so that, according to him, there is, differently from what Mr. Bale asserts of his hypothesis, an inseparable union betwixt the power of producing excellent works and the idea of their essence and manner of producing them. And it seems to me that there can be no pretense for the retortion of atheists unless it were asserted that God had been able to give to creatures a faculty of producing excellent works. The ideas whereof never were in any understanding. But my father is so far from asserting any such thing as this that he holds the operations of the plastic nature to be essentially and necessarily dependent on the ideas in the divine intellect. So, what she is claiming is that her father's plastic nature does not claim to give creatures these ideas. It's not like this is supposed to like endow creatures with rationality. Rather, it is just an instrument that God uses. It's an instrument that follows the very thoughts of God. It's not God himself. It's just an instrument that God uses to implement this kind of beauty and order and pattern that we see in the universe. If you were interested in trying to understand more of Cudworth's philosophy, this would also be an acceptable paper topic. One of the reasons we're doing this reading is it actually gives us an opportunity to kind of talk about this guy even though we don't really have like a reading by him. And there's a lot of interesting scholarship on this. So one thing to think about is how might this exchange on Cudworth's theory of plastic nature be related to Leibniz's philosophy? Any thoughts on, it doesn't have to be exact, I don't, I'm, not, and I'm, I'm not looking for anything particular or specific here, I'm just really open question. Do you see any connections at all between this idea of plastic nature and what Leibniz is saying in his philosophy? Yeah? It seems like plastic nature equates animal instincts to, like, our souls. And so, with how is that like Leibniz then? Because, like, our souls are monads and us, and monads and instincts and animals. 
penis. It's definitely, so you're right, the, there's definitely this commonality where it's a way to try to get this like purpose-drivenness into nature. And so for Leibniz, he does this by making the monads all be purpose-driven. Cudworth is doing this not by saying that individual things have this purpose-driven nature, but that God uses plastic nature to give it that purposeness, that goal-oriented movement. Any other thoughts on how these might be connected? That's good. Yeah? Would, would Leibniz think that um, God moves animals just like he moves humans? Yeah. That gives them paths, so I feel like that would be sort of the same thing, just for animals, not people. So animals contain within them, you know, their complete nature, their complete, at their that sort of perfect notion or concept. So they, their existence is very similar to ours. So for Leibniz, God doesn't have to work through some third thing called plastic nature to accomplish his will. God just built it right into each individual existing thing. So this is what I think you should try to take away from this reading. The main thing is to think about these criticisms of monads. They are inconceivable, and it's hard, how can you attribute structure to them if they are immaterial things? And then secondly, um, how she defends her father's work against this guy Bale, and how she explains that to Leibniz, and thinking about how Leibniz might want that to be part of, uh, would be interested in that from the perspective of his philosophy. Um, any final questions or thoughts about Leibniz or Lady Masham? After today, we are all done with Leibniz, so this is your, your last chance. What I want to do next is go over your papers for the class. So on Moodle, you can bring up this document. Um, this document, the cover page, I should say, I want your very first page to look just like this in a way. This very top line in all capital letters, I want that to be the title of what you, you title your paper. Um, you need to have, if you can, get these little horizontal lines in there. Say, an article review presented to Dr. DePoe, Marywood University, in partial fulfillment of the requirements for course uh, Phil 303-01. By your name, date submitted, all right? Um, what you're going to be doing in this paper, let me tell you a little bit about this before we go through these parts, is I want you to find something that is published in an academic journal or book, so not a blog, not a website, not an encyclopedia article, but a work of scholarship that is related to the things we're doing in this class. I can assure you, because I ordered a good number of books in our library, that you can find in our library a number of things that would be perfect for this. Um, you could, and all I want you to do is to find one article. I'm not asking you to do research and dig up like 5, 10, 15 different sources. Find one good article. You're going to read it, and then you're going to, in this format, give me an analysis of it. Review it for me. The very first part of this, or the very first thing should be at the very top. And what you should do is it single space it and create a bibliographic entry like you would have in your uh, in an MLA or Chicago Manual style works cited page. You know, so it'd be last name, comma, first name, period, title of the work, so on. Um, under that, I want you to have in the paper this heading, introduction, bolded and centered just like this. And underneath that, I want you to write in maybe a paragraph or two an introduction to what you're writing on. 
your introduction should not be a part of summarizing the article. Like, you shouldn't use the introduction to tell me the content of the article. Use the introduction to introduce me to the topic. Raise my interest in what you're doing. Um, try to use that as a way to, to, to bring your reader into what this paper is about without telling me the content <coughs> of what you're about to say. Um, in here, I've got all the stuff about what you need to do. You know, make sure that you're using the right font, that you're using, you know, the right margins, all that kind of good stuff. I've got all that in here. You need, you can read that. Um, your introduction should be two paragraphs at the most, and it should be no more than half a page long. I don't really want a long introduction. Cut to the chase. Get me excited about this topic. And let's move on to the summary. The summary is where you will, in about one and a half pages, or 35 lines of double space text, you will summarize the content of this article, or the book chapter, or whatever you've read. Um, in that summary, um, I want you to just give me a big picture. What is the thesis? What are they trying to argue or demonstrate or, or tell us about in this article? And what are the, the highlights of it? What, it? what are the main points? What are the things that are of most importance in there? Um, the article needs to be related to things that we are doing in class. If you're having a hard time finding one or you're not really sure what counts or what doesn't, if you are interested in something and you can't find an article on it, come and see me. So if you wanted to write about what does animal what does Leibniz think about, you know, animal consciousness or something, we could probably find an article on that. If you're interested in how does uh, Descartes, you know, explain um, the the mind body interaction, we find an article on that. If you wanted to write a piece about whether Descartes' philosophy is feminist or if it's contrary to feminism. You can find articles on that. If you want to write a piece on um, how the mind-body interaction works with Leibniz, it doesn't work, put that, we could find an article on that. We can find articles on any of the things that we're covering in this class. Um, Generally, these reviews don't contain footnotes or references to any outside sources. So you don't really need to ever cite anything. If you feel compelled to do that, we can talk about how to do that. But I don't really want you to, I don't want to make this into a major research project. Um, so after doing a page and a half of summary, the main part of your paper is the critical evaluation. This is the part of the paper where you will tell me your positive and negative appraisal of the thing you've read. And by this, I don't mean what you liked about it and didn't like about it, what you enjoyed, what you thought was boring. That's not what this is about. This is about the strength of the article. Did it succeed in establishing the points it was trying to make? Or did it fail? Um, were there quotate were, were there was it did it explain the views that we're talking about? So if we read if you read something about Leibniz on free will, one of the things that you you know enough about Leibniz's philosophy to where you can ask of an article, did it do a good job of accounting for all the things in Leibniz's philosophy related to free will? Did it answer your questions? Did it make sense? You might come back and say, no, it didn't, because he didn't explain this aspect, and this seems to run contrary to his view. Um, so, this, in your writing, the critical parts of this should be where you're saying, this is where the author succeeded in establishing their point of view, this is where the author failed at doing that, and this is why. Or this is what I thought was reasonable, this is what I thought was unreasonable. This is what was clear, this is what wasn't clear. And if you say it's not clear, tell me why. It's not clear because it could have been read this way or it could have been read that way. Um, you need to have the critical review part of this to be four complete pages. Um, 
These are not the only ways that you can approach the critical evaluation, but here are some ways. You could ask, what is the author's central thesis in the article, and does the author succeed in establishing it? And if so, how does the author establish it? And if not, why didn't they establish it? Um, in what way was this article unique, or how does it contribute new to our understanding of the topic? What are the weaknesses of the article? Which, which ideas are not explained clearly? What claims are unsupported? What arguments were weak? Um, what did the author fail to discuss that is relevant to the subject? All those things would be things for you to be thinking about when you get critical about it. Um, and I say this in several different ways here, but when providing your critical evaluation, it is important to be specific and to provide reasons that support your evaluations. Avoid saying things that are unsupported. Avoid saying things that are just vague and general. The more specific you make it, the better. And the more specific you make it, it'll give you space now to specify why you reach that conclusion or why you hold to that opinion. Um, the final part of the paper is the conclusion. It should be about two paragraphs or half a page. And you should have the heading conclusion like this. Um, in the conclusion, you can kind of give me your overall impression of the piece. In what way, you know, who would you recommend read it? Uh, what did you generally take away from it? Um, do you think that people who are interested in those topics, would you recommend that they look at this piece to pursue those interests? Um, what is the overall value you would put to this piece of scholarship? Um, make sure you proofread this, that you edit it, that you revise it. I would not recommend trying to write this the night before it's due. Um, if you have a topic you're already interested in, I'd say, why don't you get started? Start looking around, seeing if you can find something that satisfies your interest. You could write, um, you could write something like this up in a couple weeks. You could look it over, revise it, clean it up. Um, I would recommend doing doing this in steps rather than trying to do it all in one sitting. Um, at the very end here, if you want to look at <coughs> this, here is the rubric that I use to grade uh, to grade it. You'll notice that over here on this side is the weighting. The critical evaluation is weighted the most. It's worth 30% of the overall rubric. Everything else just gets a 10% weighting. So make sure you handle this well. Do you have any questions about this review? Anything that I can answer um, that isn't clear from this or that you just want to follow up on while you got my attention? The due date is, I think, I have this on our syllabus, or our modified uh, class schedule. It is due the 16th of April. <laughs> so you still have plenty of time, um, but I obviously want to put this on your radar and get you thinking about it. And if you have some free time, um, between now and then, you should be thinking about how to get that done. Does it have to be on like a philosopher's view, or it can be other things? It could. I missed the last part. Does it have to be on a philosopher's view, or it can be other things? It needs to be about related to what the the yeah. philosophers were reading. So it could be about. It, I see. I think it needs to be about their philosophical views. All right. So if you want to do a paper on Leibniz, I want to know about his philosophy, not about his calculus. Or if you do. Bar we're going to read this guy, Barclay. I want you to talk about his view of uh, philosophy, not his view of like physics. Other ideas, questions, comments? If you're not sure if a source is right or is the right kind of source, it doesn't even hurt if you email me and say, I'm thinking about using this for my paper. Is that okay? I could look it over in a moment and be like, yeah, that would be fine. Or no, if you do that, you will fail the class. <laughs> it may be worth dropping me that email just to know. But I, I say that, but I want to emphasize anything in an academic journal <coughs> will be fine, and anything that is from an academic book that is not just an encyclopedia article would be fine as well. Well... I guess we are 
Good. If you, I'll hang around if there's any final questions. Um, otherwise, I'll see you next week, and don't forget to do your reading.